Carolina and other shellfish growers. And um, also serve as an opportunity to network, exchange information, and learn from experts, including one another. So um, when she uh, posed this idea, we formed a planning committee with uh, Allison Matzel and Chris Bailey, Aaron Fleckenstein of the North Carolina Coastal Federation, uh, my coworker, Brian Snyder in North Carolina Sea Grant, and of course, uh, Catherine uh, and the North Carolina Shellfish Growers Association. We'll begin our inaugural, our inaugural seminar on oyster seed um, in just a minute. Uh, but first I wanna just do a little bit of uh, housekeeping. Uh, I want everybody to please note that this seminar is being recorded and the recording will be made available in the near future. Uh, we'll start the seminar with presentations from two oyster seed and genetics experts in just a minute. And after their presentations, we'll follow up with a Q&A and discussion. For that, everybody, I wanna point out uh, for those new to Zoom, that everybody has access to the chat function uh, for asking questions and communicating. For those um, who aren't familiar with it, there's a function bar at the bottom of your screen. Uh, sometimes you may need to hover over that function bar or the bottom of your screen with your mouse for that function bar to pop up. The uh, chat function should appear in the middle of that function bar. Uh, you also have the ability to mute yourself and to uh, start or stop your video. That should be on the left side of that function bar. We ask that everybody please keep themselves muted uh, during the presentations. And uh, Brian will be monitoring the chat. Please feel free to put the questions in the chat at any point. You don't need to wait until after the presentations to, to pose your question in chat, but we will uh, be going through them systematically um, at the conclusion of the presentation. Uh, with that, it is my pleasure to welcome and introduce our first speaker, Dr. Jessica Moss Small. She's the Associate Director of the Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences, Aquaculture, Genetics, and Breeding Technology Center. And Dr. Moss Small will be speaking on oyster genetics and seed selection. So uh, please welcome Dr. Moss Small, everybody. I will um, turn over controls. All right, thank you. Um, you hear me okay? Oh, yes, we can. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, Nate is here as well. He's going to speak after me. Um, nice to see a lot of familiar names and faces um, in Zoom world this evening. Um, this is very, you know, kind of high level and casual. Um, so I really look forward to having, you know, questions and discussion later. Um, so with that, I will try to share my screen and give this a whirl. Um, can everybody see that okay? It's up. Thumbs up? Okay, great. So, um, so Eric asked me to speak specifically kind of on the genetic side of things, um, and I'll talk a little bit about seed selection, and then Nate's going to take over and talk about more of the, like, the handling and the nitty gritty, um, the nitty gritty side. So, for those of you down in North Carolina that either haven't been to VIMS or don't know much about ABC, I just thought I would take a minute to kind of advertise for the center. Um, so, we're part of William & Mary, but we're at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science here in Gloucester Point. We run two hatcheries, um, so this one on the bottom left is our hatchery here in Gloucester Point. And then we have another hatchery about 40 minutes away on the Rappahannock River, um, the Kaufman Aquaculture Center. Uh, that was originally created to, um, to serve as an, a quarantine facility um, back in the Erie, Kansas era, for those that remember that. Um, in its recent, um, recent years, it's been used as sort of polyploid central, but now we use both hatcheries interchangeably. Um, ground is broken and a new hatchery is being put up here um, on the VIMS campus at the moment. Um, and at some point, these two hatcheries will be under one roof. Uh, we have testing and broodstock grow out, um, varies if we have different experiments going on, et cetera, but you know, five to six locations generally. There's about 10 folks in the center. Um, and our, our focus and mission is broad, um, but we have a very research-driven focus as well as industry advisory. We do a lot of training, and then our primary product is broodstock. 
which we'll discuss. So breeding, um, you know, breeding has, has been going on extensively in the crop world for, you know, generations and generations. You know, once upon a time, wild corn looked like this, and then we have the corn that we know today on the farm. Uh, similarly, you know, in the, in the protein side of things, you know, Atlantic salmon used to just be, a, you know, a wild caught, uh, wild caught um, fish. And these days there's extensive programs for Pacific and Atlantic salmon breeding. And then we get to oysters, you know, what once was the wild harvest um, because of ABC, um, other programs, you know, in North Carolina, like UNCW, uh, Rutgers, uh, programs in Maine and up and down the East Coast, um, the, the Eastern oyster looks quite a bit different these days. So when I talk about breeding, I just want to keep in mind that we're focusing both on the spat on shell market, um, which I'm sure I don't have to explain what that is, um, but as well as the singles market. So we have a dual focus in the breeding. In many cases, the breeding objectives will, um, will result in positive benefits for both industries. So for example, meat yield is one of the things that we breed for. And meat yield is important for the shucked product as well as it is for the half shell market. Because when you open that oyster, you want to have a full meat. Um, so there's a dual purpose there. So a little bit about breeding here at ABC. Uh, ABC started really in the late 1990s as an initiative um, at the, the level of the Virginia Assembly to do something about the oyster problem. So um, breeding started with building genetic stocks for disease resistance. Because here in Chesapeake Bay, the wild oysters are really, in addition to being subjected to um, overfishing um, and habitat loss, disease has been a, a big issue. And the two diseases that we have here um, are uh, MSX, which it's, you know, its Latin name is H. nelsoni, so a protozoan parasite. And then this other protozoan, uh, Perkinsis marinus, which is also called Dermo. So in order to breed for that, we wanted to bring in, or we did bring in stocks from other places along the Eastern seaboard. So the Debbies and crossbreed lines that had been created at Rutgers University already had some natural uh, disease resistance to MSX. So uh, Stan Allen, um, the director of ABC, brought those here to VIMS to propagate. In addition, brought in wild stocks um, from Louisiana that had some uh, re disease resistance to dermo. And then from that started a mass selection campaign. And by mass selection, in essence, we would grow out, you know, anywhere between, you know, 40 and 50,000 of various lines, put them in stressful environments. So whether that's here in the York River, where there's a high dermo and MSX burden, or in a low salinity environment, um, go back when they're, you know, full, um, full size adults, and then, you know, the biggest and best and the survivors become the broodstock for the next generation. The second tier animals at the time were what we distributed to industry in, in, in our early years as the broodstock lines that we distributed. But it was this portion here, kind of at this, side, this end of the graph that we would keep for ourselves. So the very, very top tier would become the parents of the next generation. And after just a few generations, I won't show any data, um, but you know, for, for this crowd, but after just a few generations, we were able to show a significant increase in survival, as well as growth in our mass selected lines. So breeding today um, is, is become quite complicated in, in some ways, um, but you know, we, our mass selection um, of lines sort of ended around 2012, and we still propagate the lines that we developed during that time. So many of you may be familiar with the Debbies, the crossbreeds, you might have received Hannah's as seed in the past, um, Lola's, et cetera. Those all came out of the mass selection program. Our family breeding program has also been running in parallel since 2004. And in, in short, in families, what we're able to do is really, um, really get specific about our breeding objectives. So a family in this context, in a breeding context, is a single culture where all the relatives in there come from one male and one female. And in doing that and keeping track of the pedigree of all the cultures that we create um, in the data that we collect from the field on their performance, we're able to very specifically target um, breeding objectives such as um, growth, survival, shape characteristics, meat yield, etc. So we've been doing family breeding 
um, you know, in fits and starts since 2004. And there are products of our family breeding, which are now, uh, now broodstock lines that are available to hatcheries, many of which you may have already heard of, Henry being one of them um, and Lily being another. So those came from our family program. So what makes up families also are, there's a, a lot of wild genetics in here, um, populations from um, both from Louisiana, um, wild stocks from the Bay, et cetera, went into our early, our early families in addition to those mass selected lines. So they have the, the best genes, you know, from the crossbreeds, the Debbies, the Lolas, the Hannahs, but they also have aspects of wild genes that are beneficial as well. And we've been continuing to hone that down. So in terms of breeding, um, specifically for diploid traits, um, not surprisingly, you don't have a product if something doesn't survive. So survival is number one. Um, growth rate um, in, the, in terms of length is very important, obviously, and total weight. And these are highly related. So typically, a long animal is also a heavy animal, not surprising. We also can specifically uh, target shape characteristics, like what we call width index, or how round an oyster is, um, cup depth as well. And, I, and we do realize that husbandry plays a big role in what these oysters look like when they get to be market size. Um, and then meat yield. And you may be wondering, well, you know, when it comes down to it, how do you weight these? Because, you know, shape, shape is something that you can control, but, you know, survival maybe not as much, um, et cetera. So we actually can weight these traits differently. For example, we can weight growth rate and survival higher than um, these shape characteristics if we wanted to. And that is what we're doing at the moment. And meat yield also has a high weight. If it turns out, for example, that um, people want to start having long, skinny oysters, we could change our breeding goals and we could change the weight accordingly to produce a product or a broodstock line that, that is specific for what the industry wants. Um, so those are kind of our usual suspect traits that we're breeding for. And how we go about this, um, similar to mass selection, we have to grow these animals out in environments where they experience stress. Um, and because our customers are up and down the East Coast in low salinity environments and high salinity environments, you know, low disease, high disease, we have to have test sites that mirror those environments accordingly. So we have test sites, um, low salinity test sites in particular. Um, we have a relationship with the Horn Point Lab up here in Cambridge. So we have a, a site that we use up there on the chop tank where it gets very low in terms of salinity. So five to six parts per thousand is very normal low disease pressure, but obviously low salinity is, is a big stressor. We also have a site off the Potomac in the Cone River um, within Virginia that also serves as a, as a replicate low salinity site. And then we grow at locations um, and, you know, that are more have a more moderate salinity. So you know that 18 to, for us anyway here, moderate salinity is you know, 18 to 23 parts per thousand, um, general, you know, plus or minus. But with that comes higher disease pressure. So it's in these environments down here where we have high dermo and we have high MSX pressure. So this is where we have our test sites um, or progeny test deployments. And just ex some examples of the different types of gear. We have a long line system here at the Gloucester Point campus. Um, and we have a long line system as well as at the Horn Point campus. Uh, we also grow in, in rack and bag as well. We don't use floating gear um, for our testing, um, but I know that many, many of you do. This is just what, what we do in, in specifically um, for, you know, for our testing. Just some pictures, um, rack and bag. I'm sure you've all seen that before. Clean, clean long line baskets. Um, we grow ours at, at quite a, um, quite a high tidal height here. We don't do a lot of raising them out of the water to desiccate. We just keep them at a pretty aggressive tidal height and let Mother Nature desiccate for us. Um, and then data collection, big part of our program. So the fall here really focuses on data collection, bringing um, all of our families and replicates in, um, taking survival assessments, a lot of measuring, et cetera. Um, so you know that that's what goes into the breeding. We won't get into the quantitative genetic side, but that's you know the the meat of the program is all focused on optimizing you know the spawning, the grow out, and the data collection because without good data. You know, we don't have um, good breeding or can't produce, produce good gains. So it's just kind of stepping then onto something different. Um, Eric asked me to talk a little bit about triploids. Um, I'm sure many of you grow triploids, um, maybe exclusively. 
Um, and I don't know if, if all of you are aware of the history of sort of how triploids came to be. So for those that, that might be newer to, you know, newer to the industry, I thought I would mention that, you know, back in um, the early 2000s when Chrysoster ariakensis, this Asian oyster, was being considered for introduction to Chesapeake Bay, in order to grow it in the wild or grow it out in the water, um, to compare it to Virginica, they had to create a sterile form of it. And this is where Stan, um, with his experience making polyploids, came in, and in doing so made uh, sterile Chrysostra, Virgin uh, Chrysostra aricensis, or this Asian oyster, to be able to put it out in the water for testing. Similarly, in order to have a fair comparison, they also made triploid Virginica at the time. And you know, the, the moral of the story is, or the conclusion of the story is, after you know, many millions of dollars were spent um, and a lot of research was performed, it was a no-go and decided that Airy Kansas wouldn't be introduced. But as a byproduct of that, to, to many folks' benefit, it was, deter it was observed how great triploid virginica were, how quickly they grew, that they, you know, they provided a, a crop that you know, kept its condition all year round. Um, and so that's really how triploids and, and people growing triploids took off. It was sort of a, um, it was sort of an accident, but um, but a good result. So I don't expect anybody to follow this, but for people who want a little more information about how the heck you know tetraploids are made, because these days hatcheries use tetraploids crossed with diploids to make triploids. Um, so just bear with me for a minute as I go through this. There's no test at the end. You, know, you start with your diploids. Can you all see my mouse? Yeah, okay. So you start, you know, you start with your diploids that are ripe. And on spawning day, after you fertilize them, when that first polar body is formed, so it's a process that happens during meiosis. If you've ever looked at um, an oyster embryo under the microscope, there's a little kind of belly button that comes off of it. It's actually when that that cell that normally has two sets, that otherwise has two sets of chromosomes, one of them buds off. Um, it's during that process that you can then treat the embryos with cytochalasin B or CB or 6D map. And it'll actually cause the embryos to keep that polar body. And in doing so, if you can get those to survive, you end up with a triploid. You then grow the triploids out, so you know, a couple years later, and, and you're probably ask, you're thinking to yourself, well, they're sterile, so what is that, what's that gonna do? Um, so roughly, you know, one in a thousand triploids will actually produce viable gametes. So you have to open a lot of animals, so it's not an easy process. And if you're lucky, you find that blue moon oyster that has eggs. And so then you cross that triploid with a diploid male and you do this process again, where you treat the polar bodies so that it keeps all the chromosomes and you end up with a chemical tetraploid. If you're lucky and you can grow these out, um, you know, they're not a very robust um, organism in the field if you've ever tried to grow or, or make, te make tetraploids yourself, let alone keep them alive. You then can, once you have four C tetraploids or four chemical or chemical tetraploids, you can mate them together to get mated tetraploids. And at that point, you can grow those out and propagate them. So mated tetraploids are fertile, um, and you can treat them just like you would a diploid in the sense that you, know, you have males, you have females, you can cross them and spawn them, et cetera. One thing to note, though, is that tetraploids are quite a bit more difficult to condition. They also condition, it, it, we believe, at a slower rate than diploids do. Um, so if, for hatcheries that, that want to make triploids, they have to time, you know, time their conditioning um, processes such that they have ripe tetraploids at the same time as they have ripe diploids, which is, it's an art. So appreciate where your triploids come from, I think, from, from this. And, and you all know the difference, really, if, you know, between a, a diploid and a, a triploid, if they're the same age. Generally, the triploids um, are quite a bit bigger, and they retain their meat quality all year round. Um, and this is just, in case you were wondering, so the hatcheries, when they request broodstock, they are looking for male tetraploids that they then cross with the female diploids to make your triploids. So the female tetraploids actually just get tossed by the hatcheries and not used. They don't produce great eggs, so that's why they only use the males, and they cross those with the female diploids to produce triploids. Everyone's sort of following me? Yes or no? <laughs> 
you can ask, feel free to ask questions at the end too. Um, so just a little bit about, you know, great, thumbs up. Thanks, Eric. Um, for what we do, you know, on a, on a yearly basis, it, it, it varies year to year, you know, what hatcheries want. Um, you know, and we're seeing over time the hatcheries are getting more and more um, efficient at conditioning, so they don't they need fewer animals. But generally speaking, we distribute about twenty five thousand oysters a year every fall and early winter to hatcheries. You know, and most of those are diploids, and then a small percentage of those are tetraploids as well. So um, a little bit about the broodstock and licensing, and, and we're talking about this, you know, many of you may just be growers, but I think it's maybe interesting to you to find out where some of this broodstock comes from and how the hatcheries get it. Or if you're on the call here and you're a hatchery owner, this should be of interest as well. So our broodstock, um, you know, the, from our selected lines and our, our family broodstock is actually intellectual property. So it's run through an, um, a technology transfer office on main campus. And if a hatchery would like to get broodstock from us, first you want to email Nate because he's the broodstock manager. But keep in mind that you're going to need to sign a contract um, related to, related to um, your production because these are actually licensed. There is a licensing agreement associated with our broodstock. Um, and from that, you should be prepared that at the end of your production season, You'll need to um, you'll need to pay William and Mary 15% of your gross seed sales, um, based only on spawns using our brood stock. Keep in mind, and $60 per million for eyes larvae. And what that does is, you know, some of it goes back to William and Mary, and then some of it comes back to ABC and enables us to keep the operations going, um, to enable us to keep our brood stock supply up, to keep the research going, etc. Um, so if you're interested in brood stock, um, contact Nate, and then also. In terms of licensing agreements, this would be the person to contact on main campus, um, but Nate can also get you in touch with that, that individual as well, Jason McDevitt. So our current broodstock offerings and um, are here. This is quite busy and there, if you go to our webpage and I'll give you a link to it at the end, you can find this online as well. This just talks a little bit about what I discussed before in terms of, you know, we have various lines that have been selected for specific environments. So, you know, our Debbies and crossbreeds, which are, you know, those are um, tried and true lines that we've carried for a long time. They are pretty similar, for example, with high resistance to MSX, uh, moderate resistance to Dermo. Everything has been selected for fast growth and high survival, um, but where they've come from is slightly different. And then Lola is, is primarily used as a low salinity line, but Anecdotally, we've heard that it does really well in, in a wide range of environments. And then from our family program, we have our, our newer lines here. So Henry is a high salinity line um, that, you know, it, it encompasses, as I said before, wild populations, um, and then all of our super lines genetics are in there as well. And it's selected for fast growth, high survival, and then specifically also for meat yield and shell shape. And then Lily is its counterpart, H for high, Lily for low. We're really original with our, our acronyms. Um, that's primarily um, been bred for low salinity survival, as well as high meat yield and shell shape. This here on the bottom is really of more interest for hatcheries. So we do have a number of different tetraploid lines available that the hatcheries can choose from. And our, our data to date in how shows that there really is no difference in the triploid created from any of these tetraploid lines. It's really just a hatchery preference. Um, we used to have a line called Gen, that was our original tetraploid line, and for a while that's all we had. And then we had this GNL line, and so people would get, or hatcheries would get a little, you know, some Gens and some GNLs, and I, from the most part, from what we've heard, they used whatever conditioned, you know, best at the time, wherever they could get males from, and that's what they would use. And then fire is the new tetraploid line. And I won't get into that here, but we also have a parallel breeding program um, for tetraploids as well. And so we're doing things um, to try to improve the tetraploid side of triploids as well. So into just kind of the nuts and bolts, and, and you know, Nate's gonna talk more about this, but some, you know, some fairly obvious seed selection considerations. You know, first and foremost, do you wanna buy diploids or triploids? Um, you know, sometimes the cost is different. Um, depending on who you're buying it from. 
when do you want to harvest? You know, are you is this a, a, a business that you know you're you're only interested or, or you only care about harvesting, you know, in the fall and winter when the diploids would be a very good condition? Or if you want to harvest all year round, maybe you want to consider triploids because in general they'll keep their condition. Um, we are aware of a concern about triploid mortality. Um, there's many folks here at VIMS, um, at UNC, at other institutions on the East Coast trying to get at this triploid mortality issue. To date, we can't pinpoint it to a certain line, um, to a certain pathogen, a certain environmental stressor. So now we're kind of going down the, the, the path um, and looking at things like how, how does metabolism play a role? How does the, you know, the, the algae species and abundance available at the time of year when these you know, supercharged triploids are growing you know, in that spring and early summer. Um, so if that is the case and you've heard of triploid mortality, all the more reason get some diploids and some triploids. You know, diversity is never gonna hurt you. Uh, similarly, what kind of, you know, in, in kind of changing gears a little bit, what size of seed, you know, are you capable of handling? Do you, are you able to nursery really small stuff or is it better for you for husbandry to buy a little bit bigger seed and you're happy to pay a little bit more? Um, and then as I've, I've hopefully illustrated before, um, there's a lot of different options for growers out there, you know, not just ABC lines, you know, there's, there's material coming out of UNC, you know, out of Rutgers, you know, um, you know in the Northeast, you know, MOOC has, has specific lines. Um, but keep in mind, what are the conditions where you're growing? And if you don't know, you can go on Amazon and you can spend 20 bucks and you can buy a refractometer you know, once a week, you know, for, for the year or for a couple of months, keep track of how your salinity changes. Um, if you are having mortality or you know of mortality in, in oysters near your farm or where you're proposing to grow, I encourage you to contact your local shellfish pathologist. Um, you know, you can get that information through Amy Wilbur. I know she's on the call. Um, Tal Ben Horn is a great resource for you guys down at UNC. He could take a look, you know, whether it's a pathogen issue, um, et cetera. Um, always good to consider um, if you're just starting out what's worked well for others near your farm, like no harm and, and going well. Well, that's, you know, going with what's worked well for others. Um, but we encourage you to really be observant. And when you purchase lines, you know, especially early on, if you're not sure about how things are going to perform, try to keep them separate. You know, it involves labeling. It involves a little bit of bookkeeping. We know when it comes to a commercial farm, you know, it's not beneficial to keep all your stuff separate. Once everything's at a, a certain size, you grade it, you throw it all together. But once you mix all your lines, if you see mortality, you're not going to be able to attribute it necessarily to one thing or another, which isn't going to help you be able to narrow down what works best on your farm. Um, so it's a little bit of extra work, but it can go a long way, especially if you're having issues to have to enable somebody to help you. Um, if you've kept a little bit of data, you know, what's your salinity been like? Has there been a big rain event? And what lines you're growing? So with that, um, and I will put, I'll make sure that this information gets in the chat in the end. Um, if you want more information about ABC, um, please, you know, please go to our website. Most of this is very up to date. We just did a big, you know, uh, website overhaul. And within this, where it's, it says industry products, is where you can get more information about our broodstock lines available, uh, Nate's information, et cetera. Um, so you know, feel free to you know, peruse this and, and find us more on the web. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop. Um, and I think we're going to hold questions for Nate and I at the end. So um, I'm going to you know, change screens now, and Nate's going to hop on, hop on and, and talk to you. So. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, Dr. Moss-Small, for that fantastic presentation on oyster genetics and breeding and seed selection. Uh, really, really great information. And uh, yes, as, um, as a reminder, please uh, put your questions in the chat and we'll take questions and have discussion after the next presentation. Uh, for those, again, that may be new to Zoom, the chat function is in the middle of the function bar at the bottom of your screen. You may need to uh, hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen for that function bar to pop up. But uh, as soon as you see that bar in the middle, there is a chat function. You can click on that and then type your question in at any point in time. 
<clears throat> at the end of uh, the next presentation, we will uh, systematically go through the, the questions in the chat and, and have discussion. So um, in addition, uh, I think everyone's doing a great job so far, but if everyone would please keep themselves on mute, the mute button is in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, and you can also start or stop your video in the bottom left corner as well of that function bar. Uh, with that, please join me in welcoming our next speaker, Mr. Nathan Geierhan. Uh, Mr. Geierhan is the field manager and broodstock manager at Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences Aquaculture Genetics and Breeding Technology Center. And he will be speaking to us or with us today on oyster seed shipping, handling, acclimation, and planting. So uh, please welcome Mr. Geierhan, everybody. Hi, Thank welcome. You. I know a few of you and uh, it's nice to see your faces and welcome uh, all the people that I don't know. Um, I will start by saying that um, all the things that Jess was talking about are things that that I know a little bit about or quite a lot about. Um, and over the years, um, this program has grown. I've been here um, actually since the program started. So all those year, early years where things were a little bit more difficult and a little less, um, you know, manageable, um, I learned an awful lot about uh, growing things, probably the hard way or definitely the hard way. So. I certainly know the School of Hard Knocks. Maybe that's the only school I know. Um, but I've learned a little bit about science as well along the way. Um, I'll show you my first slide. Uh, these are my Nate's Laws of Oyster Husbandry. Um, I try to, I'm a person who really tries to avoid sort of recipes because um, if any of you have done this long enough, you'll realize that it's something that always depends on the situation and people like to um, pinpoint exactly how you do something or how much or when or all of those things and my answer is always well it depends it depends on all kinds of things and so um, you need to be paying attention from year to year and you need to change what you do from year to year depending on what the conditions are or what your animals are telling you um, my second rule is never always do the same thing. So don't lull yourself to sleep by getting programmatic and not paying attention and saying, I did this last year, it worked. Um, it may not work, but it may work as well. So be aware of that and be willing to adapt and be willing to change as, as things change because they do. You're dealing with a live animal and you're dealing with uh, Mother Nature, and you're dealing with all kinds of different things constantly. Um, third is pay attention to what the oysters are telling you. Um, of course, they can't talk, and of course, they look like rocks, but they really can tell you a lot about what's going on inside there. Um, watch them, pay attention to them, observe them, always look, spend some time on your farm, spend some time looking at your seed, if you're willing to do it, write things down and keep a journal because it can be very, very helpful. It seems like it isn't at the time, but if you keep it and you look back, oftentimes things that you observe will, will be helpful going forward. Um, listen to caution with experts. Um, I'm, I guess I'm an expert, but I don't like the word. So <laughs> if somebody tells you they're an expert, you want to know why they think they're an expert. And uh, I can say that I don't know anything for sure in this in this world uh, when it comes to oysters. I'm constantly surprised and I've been doing this for over 20 years. So it's good to be humble. And if you're not humble, start oyster farming and you'll get there very quickly. Um, talk to other farmers. Um, it's always wonderful to listen to people who have you know, done it. Uh, we're in a sophisticated program here, and certainly we know more than we did when we started. But oyster farmers, especially ones that are really paying attention and try hard, can often be a really good source of information and can be a lot of support. And it can be very helpful to stay in touch with what's going on, especially in your state, and especially places that are close to your particular site. So 
I like to get those basic kind of fundamental things in people's heads when they're when they're asking questions or they want to know how to do something specific. And with that, I'll go on to some seed handling basics and that kind of thing. Um, I think the number one thing is that when you are moving seed around or shipping it or whatever you're doing with it is to avoid big changes in temperature. Um, they're a tough animal. Um, but if you're going to move it from one place to another or one um, environment to another, um, you want to take it out and you know keep it keep it cool or whatever. Um, but you don't want a huge delta between the, the temperature that it came out of and the temperature that it's going into. Um, storing things in the storing seed in the shade um, is a very simple and useful kind of thing. You know, um, they don't in the sun; they're going to dry out. They're going to heat up. Um, you you want to avoid that. Um, keeping them damp is important. How damp? I don't know. Um, put wet newspaper on them, a wet blanket, um, or something like that. Don't cover them with, you know, a tarp for too long that doesn't breathe. Um, and just keep them damp. They're happy that way. Um, don't refrigerate unless you're going to eat oysters. Um, that, there's an exception to that. You can put them in the refrigerator in the winter, but if, if the temperatures are, you know, in the 50s or above, there's no reason to go down to 40 or 39. It's just too big of a too big of a change for them. And they're going to do better closer to what the ambient temperatures are outside and in the water. Um, one of the best places you can do it is if you do have a facility where you've got seawater or indoor storage, um, a, a damp cement floor inside of a garage or a facility is, is a perfect place to do that. Even with air conditioning, it's almost even better. Um, one thing that some people tend to do over time, you won't do it because you won't have the time to do it or the manpower or the energy, but don't overhandle or overgrade your, your seed. Um, do what's needed and, and don't do things that you don't need to do. Um, handle it, split it, take care of it, but don't overhandle it. Um, do not freeze it. Um, it can survive freezing. I've pushed the boundaries limits on that. I can't tell you what they are, but I've frozen stuff solid. And sometimes they'll thaw out and live, and sometimes they won't. But do not freeze it if you want it to live afterwards. Um, the best way to store seed is sort of in bulk in a um, in a mesh bag versus you know a plastic bag or something that doesn't allow air. And if it's moist or damp, that's a that's also a good thing. Um, and keep it cool just below ambient air temperature. Um, and that's, that's probably the best thing for it. So with that, I'll move on to shipping, packaging, and redeployment. Um, in my experience, I do this with adults a lot. We don't handle seed or move it around too much, except for our own purposes. Um, but it's the same general idea. Use overnight or next day air. Um, you want to get it to wherever it's going as soon as possible. Um, same thing, pack in a mesh bag. Um, put the bags tight in a cooler or a styrofoam box with a cardboard outer box and use minimal amounts of ice packs and avoid direct contact with the oysters if you can do it. Um, it's not going to be disastrous if you do, but if you can leave a buffer between the oysters and, you know, your cold source or ice packs or whatever it is, you don't need them down to refrigerated temperatures or anything like that. So you just want them cool. Um, wet newspaper works really well in a box. And so that they don't jostle around or get thrown around in shipping and break your box or anything else, it's, it's good to pack the box tight so that they don't jostle. Um, and when you get them, um, the best thing to do is let them sit outside and acclimate to your air temperature, air you know temperature on a cement floor or whatever. Um, I don't know for how long, a half a day or a little bit of time, a few hours, just to come to the, the natural ambient temperature before you deploy them. Um, the last thing I'll talk about is is a disease report and the permitting. 
Um, there's plenty more information on this. Um, I do this with broodstock when I send it interstate. People need um, permitting for that as well as, as seed moving from state to state. Um, so if it's me that's getting um, trying to move adults someplace else, um, I would get, request a disease report. Same would be for you if you were buying seed from somebody. You would ask them to initiate a disease report with the disease lab that's closest to you. Um, the turnaround time on that varies a little bit. It's, it takes a little bit of time um, and that will produce a, um, a report, disease report. Um, sometimes the disease lab will send the report to your agency. Sometimes it's quicker that way or they know the people. Other times they'll give the um, disease report directly to you and you can pass it on. Um, prior to this, you probably want to get in touch with your state agency um, and tell them that this is coming down the line and that you're going to produce a report that they can take a look at. Um, it'll take some time for them to turn around the report and give you a permit. And when they do, um, you're good to go on that and then just keep the documents after. Um, it does vary a little bit from state to state. so. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but um, you just want to get in touch with, with you know, with your respective state, um, DNC or whatever. So, um, and with that, um, that's it for me. So I'll open it up to questions or I'm going to let Jess back in here. Uh, th thank you so much, Nate, for a fantastic right. presentation on seed handling, shipping, um, redeployment and, and acclimation really, really useful information for farmers everywhere. Um, so at this stage, uh, I'd like to yeah, open it up to everybody with questions uh, for our experts, our presenters this evening. I did uh, tell them that we wouldn't hold them too long and we would let them get back to their personal lives and families as soon as possible. So if we could have focused questions for our presenters at this stage and uh, afterwards, we can move on to general discussion uh, amongst uh, those that, that remain here in North Carolina and uh, with those who've joined us from out of state as well. So um, I think Brian's been monitoring the chat and uh, I'd like to ask him if he wouldn't mind to go through the questions in the order they were presented, please. So we just have uh, one comment very nice explanation jessica other than that no one has typed any questions into the chat so but feel free if you guys do have questions you can unmute yourself and ask them or you can type them in the chat and i can relay them uh, however is easiest for you to do it i have a question this is Catherine. go ahead Catherine. we can hear you okay cool um so well i actually have two questions but i'll just ask one and then i'll wait and see if other people have questions and then i'll ask the other but um, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more. You mentioned triploid mortality, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that. The reason why I ask is because I, I've been unhappy with, so I keep track of all of my crops. I never put them all in together. I, I, I do it from the beginning of the crop to the end. And I, I find that I'm having, uh, pretty unsatisfactory yield numbers at the end of the day, but I'm not seeing mortality. So when I when you talk about triploid mortality, is that something that you see? Like, oh my gosh, all my oysters are dying. Or I, I don't I can't quite figure out where it is that I'm losing I, these I can oysters. Handle that question. Yeah. <laughs> um, your counts are probably wrong. Um, it's really hard to um, start with one number and watch your numbers diminish. If you're truly seeing a lot of mortality or a real mortality event, you'll see dead animals, uh, especially if you're keeping an eye on them regularly. It's really tough to count oysters accurately. Some people are really good at it, others are not. Um, but if you buy 100,000 seed and they're one millimeter, you're not going to end up with that by the time you harvest it. And it can be perplexing as to where they went, but this has happened to me many times <laughs> so um, that's one thing that can happen so um, and well then, and i and i 
you know, your, your advice to talk to other farmers. I, I talk to other farmers all the time and yeah. I don't know, I find farmers a bit like fishermen. I don't think I get a straight answer yeah. out of anybody. I um, don't. No, but it's it's tell just, you if they're not doing well. Right. right. Yeah, it's difficult to access any kind of data on it to understand whether, you know, what I'm experiencing yeah. is normal or abnormal or- You're whatever. not right. alone. Right, I mean, so, and if I, could, if I could just add to what Nate said, I mean, some level of mortality, some underlying loss is very normal. Um, you know, people lose five, ten percent all the time. It's a given that oysters are going to die. You're not going to start out with a hundred thousand, you know, and and harv and market a hundred thousand. When I'm talking about triploid mortality, it's a very sort of it's a very specific thing. So when when we see triploid mortality, we're talking about su substantial, like on the order of like 40, 50, 60, 70 percent mortality in a crop almost overnight. You know, in large oysters, ones that may be recently handled, and typically, and this is very, this is local knowledge, and I'm only speaking from what we, what I know. Every, I'm sure there's lots of people on the call that have other instances that this has happened. It's usually in that late spring, early summer, everything's ramped up, everything's growing, um, and for whatever reason, and this is where the research is is trying to figure out, suddenly something tips the balance. And these beautiful triploids just croak. Um, there's been con there's been question of well, is it a triploid mortality thing, or is it just because not many people grow diploids, and is it happening to diploids? But what I've heard, you know, in in Virginia, you know, it's and it's not at every site, and it's not at every year. It's it's very kind of sporadic. Um, I know there's there were some events in North Carolina last year where people had big crop losses. Um, you know, Amy is on the call and, and others, you know, we're, we're working on that, you know, to try to see, figure out, you know, is it a diploid thing? Is it a triploid thing? You know, in some cases, these mortality events followed, you know, three days of intense rain and, and in the, you know, the salinity dropped a lot and, you know, the water was the color of tea. And, you know, in that instance, you know that there's a lot of stress, like something's in the water and a farmer happens to have triploids and they, and they die. So I would say, um, some level of mortality, as Nate said, and some level of loss is a given and has to be worked into your business plan. But when you start, you know, overnight, you come to a cage that otherwise has been, you know, husbanded well and maintained, and suddenly there's meats hanging out and you have 75% loss, like that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And that's when you need to potentially contact, you know, you know, Tal or Amy or somebody in your local agency to help you figure out what's going on. Yeah, I would also add it's not uncommon um, for the low end of of an expected yield to be fifty to sixty percent. Um, oyster farmers will lie a lot, but that that happens all the time. And if you're getting seventy five percent or better, you're doing very well, and sometimes you have a great year. But um, I know fifty to sixty percent sounds low, but it happens all the time. Um, so it's a good thing to it's that's really keep it in mind all right can i jump in here for just a second please do. Uh, those of you who don't know me i'm Slammerhead, uh sample wish company we grow only diploids and we're in the carter county area over the past couple of years when there were some heavy triploid mortalities we were still experiencing two to three percent so there, there was a lot of question then if it was run off because it usually came during high temperatures with heavy runoff afterwards. And we do have the largest agricultural farm on the East Coast right here in the county. So yeah. I don't know if that information does anybody any good, but a point to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have another question, Catherine? I don't think anyone's fighting you for. <laughs> well, I most certainly do have another question. Um, Nate, uh, sometimes uh, when I get seed in via FedEx, it's in mesh bags, but the mesh bags are then inside of a plastic bag. Mm -hmm. so do I want to tell who is ever shipping my seed, please don't put it in a plastic bag, just put it inside. Um, it's a good question. I, you know, I've, never, I've never seen that, but I also don't get seed shipped to me very, I'm kind of out of the loop on that. Yeah, I can't imagine why you'd really want to do that unless they're not sealed, you know, 
It might just be as a buffer to protect right. them from getting crushed if it's like padded plastic. But if it's no, like it's it's plastic. like it's like there's styrofoam sides mm -hmm. to the to the carton, the shipping carton inserts, and then a plastic bag and the mesh bags inside the plastic bag. I, mean, I would say the only reason why somebody might want to do something like that is if they're concerned that there's going to be moisture coming out, because sometimes FedEx or UPS or will yeah. freak out if yeah. there's liquid coming out of a box. But if it's seed that's generally dry, it should be able to just go you know, with the ice block, as Nate said, in yeah. a styrofoam container, sometimes in a cardboard box too, and be shipped yeah. without being on plastic and and it's not gonna i mean if your seed's there and it's alive it's not a big problem it's just not a really wise practice um for especially for long term i mean somebody who's shipping a lot of seed knows what they're doing um and if it's an overnight kind of thing it's probably no harm in it yeah. but as a general rule i wouldn't put it in a sealed plastic bag for very long okay yep. So we did have a question come through in the chat. Um, do tetraploids get tested at the grow out sites or does the selection for salinity, growth, disease, et cetera, get incorporated in the three N animals from the two N parents or are there selected lines for diploids only? Jess, you've spoke to that a little bit, but I ask you to touch right. on it again. Right, so that's where the, the family program with tetraploids has, has come into play and the answer is yes. So we do grow out our tetraploid families that we produce. So we produce diploid families and tetraploid families, and we grow them out side by side at the same site. So they go through the selection pressure of low salinity or high disease, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, in the case of in the case of tetraploids, though, the traits that we're interested in are a little bit different. So one, do they survive? I mean, that's kind of number one. Um, the other thing is, and this is kind of getting in the weeds, but tetraploids are weird and they've got a lot of chromosomes and a lot, you know, four sets of chromosomes and a lot of DNA and they try to actually reorganize themselves and get rid of that. And it's, it's something we call reversion. So over time, tetraploids actually try to become triploids in some ways. And we're, we've actually done some work to show that, you know, those tetraploids that were want to revert a lot actually don't grow very well. We, we don't want to use tetraploids that revert. Um, they just seem, you know, so in essence, by growing the big ones and the ones that survive, we're getting ones that don't revert and have, have high survival. How, and, and Lexi being the geneticist may, I'm sure be thinking, well, how did those, how does the tetraploid side and the diploid side correlate to the triploid product in terms of the breeding objectives and the correlations and traits? And that's, that's for the next chapter. Um, but that's what we're working on. You know, we, for years we've been focusing on the diploid, the diploid, the diploid, and really that was because it's hard to get tetraploids. It's hard. We now, you know, it's hard to have a broad tetraploid population to test. But now that we've finally kind of overcome that, we're now able to, you know, you know, split off our split our resources and not just focus on the diploid breeding, but focus on the tetraploid side as well. You know, to try to get at, you know, how how do you really make the best triploid, and and what traits on either side should we be focusing on? So I have a customer that's asked me whether our oysters are genetically modified. A customer who's focused on everything being organic, and and I say no, but. Right. And so I, I actually took it out of my presentation, but I have a great slide of, you can ask that person, do they eat strawberries? Do they eat blueberries? Do they eat seedless cucumbers? Because all of those are, are what we term polyploid. So they've taken sets, your chromosome sets and multiplied them in some way. And I can guarantee you that person probably eats cucumbers and strawberries and blueberries and things like that. In the case of oysters, it's exactly the same thing. We have not put Roundup Ready genes in them or used CRISPR technology to change them in any way. It's just a duplication of, of their whole chromosome set. So they're 100% not a GMO. So, and in, on, in line with that, Catherine, there's also a page on North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries website about common misconceptions about triploid oysters. And that is on that page if you wanted to direct that customer to that. Awesome. Oh, that's helpful. Thanks, Brian. Okay. 
anybody else have any other questions for our experts this evening? How's the time? <laughs> we have a hand up. Um, Aaron? Is that a hand up? Maybe uh, not. don't see it. Do you see it? Oh, oh, sorry, it was my mouse. So sorry. Apologies. Oh, that's okay. Okay. Well, um, six o'clock. I just want to thank you so much, uh, Jess and Nate, for joining us this evening and sharing your expertise with us. And I know it's going to help a lot of growers and uh, help our industry here in North Carolina. And um, yeah, I can't thank you enough. Thank you so much for sharing. Happy for time the out of your day with yeah. us. Thank you. Please get in touch if you have further questions too. You know how to find us. Thanks so much, have guys. We really evening. appreciate sure. it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye, -bye. Mm -hmm. So the um, rest of us can uh, hang out, and uh, we're scheduled to uh, six thirty. I know. Um, you know, one of the goals that Catherine had was that. Um, and she really wanted the seminar series to be a forum for uh, open discussion among North Carolina shellfish growers and, and others, but um, really uh, hoping to, to be able to learn from one another, um, share your expertise with one another. Um, many of you have been around for many years and um, really do have expertise in growing shellfish here in North Carolina. Others may be relatively new, but um, everybody learns something every day, I imagine. And um, there's little tricks of the trade um, that folks might have, little life hacks or oyster grower hacks that uh, people have. Um, and I think this, uh, this is a really good opportunity to share and learn from one another. So um, we have plenty of time uh, to just discuss anything about oyster seed. Um, and then maybe later on we can open up the discussion to talk about talk about our uh, next seminar, which is planned to be on biofouling. Um, so that'll be uh, in two months. We'll plan for that um, with uh, the subject of biofouling being the center for that uh, seminar. But um, in the meantime, does anybody uh, want to talk about their personal experiences or have any recommendations, suggestions, advice? regarding uh, oyster seed here in North Carolina or, or elsewhere. Is Dr. Wilbur still on? Uh, I think she might have, I think she might have signed off. I don't see her. She's gone. Just, and I'm gonna take my video off just so I get good, uh, so you guys can hear me. Um, and thanks for doing this. Uh, everybody, Mr. Snyder, Mr. Herbs. I know this is a brainchild of Catherine. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, I was just kind of curious to know, you know, we spent a lot, a long time or a lot of time, uh, you know, really working on the genetic side of it. And I was just wanting to know if there's any data out there, recent data that shows any difference in performance, um, you know, at the same site, with the same husbandry tactics with different um, genetic lines. Anybody out there know of anything? Aaron, I mean, I, I kind of feel okay. like, Ryan, that that's the holy grail, right? And I kind of feel like what I was hearing both, both of them say today was that, you know, there's no, you know, they can take these lines and they can develop these lines and they can, and they can do the best they can, but it's very difficult to, to create side-by-side -side crops with the exact same information because the weather differs, the salinity differs, the everything, nothing's ever the same from month to month and year to year. So it's almost impossible to have, you know, solid empirical data. Right. Everybody else chime in on that. I am not a scientist. <laughs> So that's just my layperson interpretation of what I was hearing today. So for the first five years, I tracked pretty much everything, grew every line, and every year I had different data. And every year the conditions were different. And every time a geneticist or a hatchery told me that one particular line was going to work best at my site, 
it was the opposite. So, you know, I, I think I think you sense that from the folks at VIMS, at least the gentleman who was saying that, you know, you have to sort of read your oysters. It's good to diversify. It's good to have a few different lines. I mean, over time, I've, I've, I have a preference for Lola's and Debbie's. I don't like the Henry's and Lily's I've experimented with, but I don't have too strong a feeling. But I have a very high salinity farm and I have a mid to low salinity farm. And, you know, the Debbie's and the Lola's seem to do best in both locations. Um, I think the best data you're going to get are from farmers who have, especially new farmers, who, ex you know, experiment with these lines. Um, there may be a, you know, a, a preference from a farmer close to you. But in the end, I, I think it varies so much from lease to lease and site to site that, you know, it, it's really hard to pin down. Um, and then you have gear types and different parts of the water column you're growing in. So the variables just start to get ridiculous. You know, it's not like growing corn. Um, and every year, you know, whether it's dissolved oxygen or salinity or, you know, different algae in the water, it, it just, it's so dynamic. It's really hard to, to pin everything down and, and keep it consistent. I think that's what the gentleman at VIMS was trying to <laughs> say. Um, there's really no consistency. We'd like there to be consistency, but it's, it's you know, there's a band of outcomes or a range of outcomes that are acceptable. And then there's, you know, stuff that's unacceptable. And that's, that's sort of the way I look at the world. Yeah. So, and part of that too, Chris, is because uh, I've spoken with other people and I've, you know, worked in hatcheries and nurseries and stuff. And I've seen that when they, you know, those family lines are the, the ones that you said you didn't care about are coming from those family spawns where those line spawns, those genetics have been, longer running genetics. Uh, so coming from the line genetics, they're a little bit more tried and true than the family spawns, which aren't, you know, continuously long running genetic lines. But as long as, you know, as long as there's something changing that you, no matter how many variables you track, something is going to change that you can't track. So it's always to keep that data, but you're not, you know, you need to try to create as thorough of as a picture, but you won't ever have the whole picture. Right. And it used to be, it drove me nuts because I'd have one bottom cage that was five foot away from another bottom cage, exact same spawn, exact same grade, exact same density, same body of water, and they were just different outcomes. And it just, it, it drove me insane and uh, decided to not, not go there. <laughs> um, so you just sort of accept what nature sends your way, basically. Yep. Well, last year, I had about 15 farmers that wanted half Debbies and half So I asked them to keep track of how they thought they grew. And it was interesting when I collected the data from them this year, almost everybody said they grew equally as well, except for two farmers. One of them wanted only Debbies this year and one of them only wanted Henry's this year. So that just goes to show you just, you know, there is no real consistency necessarily, but I have, most of my farmers love Henry's um, and Debbie's. And if you noticed when they showed the, you know, everybody's so worried about high salinity, low salinity. Just remember those oysters are getting two sets of chromosomes from the tetraploid. So the tetraploid is having much more influence on the genetics than the diploid is. And if you look, and I've never seen this before, the gen tetraploids went from a salinity of six to 20 something. So those tetraploids, when I was talking with Dr. Allen a couple of years ago, he told me, he said, those are built to, and, and I guess maybe they don't have enough data because just didn't feel comfortable talking much about that, but those tetraploids are, are, are made to be, just be a well-rounded oyster that's going to survive in a variety of salinities. And then you can add, you know, your Henry's, your Debbie's, your whatever to them. So um, yeah, what I was told when I first started this was just tell all you wonderful farmers, just keep good data and figure out what works best for you. Because at first I just felt responsible that I was supposed to figure out what was supposed to be best for these farmers. And Dr. Allen said, Susan, don't go there. You'll worry, you know, you'll worry yourself sick. <laughs> he said, just tell them to keep data and they need to come back to you and tell you what, what they want. So that's my two cents worth. On, on top of that, 
um, I've noticed a trend too, where new growers who grow 50,000 seed or 100,000 seed, they always have 100% yield or they think they do at first and they realize it's not really there. But as you scale your business, that yield number naturally goes down. And that's what I've seen consistently across a lot of farmers. If you're managing 100,000 seed with two or three you know, folks and you scale to a million or two million, your yield will absolutely go down. And I think that's what um, new growers sort of, you know, have a hard time with also. You can really baby that first crop or two and, you know, over 10 them. And that's what people do. And then they realize that, you know, they need to make money at this if it's not a hobby farm. And, and you know, when the economics come in and you're paying folks to work the farm, uh, you can't be touching stuff every 15 days or <laughs> Or, or 30 days, um, you need to space out your touches in order to make, make money at this. So that's another point that's worth noting. You know, I, if you speak to some of the biggest guys, many years ago, uh, Johnny uh, at Chesapeake Bay Oyster kind of whispered in my ear after one of the Newburn conferences that, um, you know, if you, wanna, if you wanna sell a million oysters, you pretty much need to plant 4 million oysters. Um, you know, and, and they did it with six or seven guys. So my advice, and it's not just because I'm in the seed business, is, you know, spending two to five cents a seed is the cheapest part of this business. The gear, the labor, you know, um, that that's, you know, over time, that's really the bulk of your cost. The labor being probably the most costly. I would say, you know, if you can handle it, you know, buy more seed um, from a variety of places, diversify. That's really the key, I think. And, you know, don't, don't necessarily get obsessed with yield and trying to improve your yield when you could be spending $3,000 or $5,000 more a year and, and not care as much or be obsessed by it or, um, you know, be without the numbers you need to scale your business. I would second that. I definitely try to prepare most new farmers that I talk to for that 50 to 60 number that they just spoke about, like, because it's, you're right, once they have realized that they have to scale up from 50,000 oysters a year, they start getting a little bit worried about that. <laughs> I wanted to circle back a little bit on something Chris was talking about, uh, having two racks five feet apart. <clears throat> Primarily everything we do is either on bottom or near bottom. And we'll have differences between what's in a bag on a rack, say six inches off the bottom and growing directly around that rack and then have just the opposite differences uh, 10, 15 feet away. And I think we're, we're in a high energy area and we catch a lot of heavy boat weights off the intercoastal and we get a lot of Southwest beaters coming in there. I think a lot of it has to do with just the current flow and the nutrition they're getting. On one side, you've got a lift in the nutrition, and on the other side of the lump, you've got a drop. And it's the only thing I can attribute it to. Uh, it's uh, kind of hard to track 50 to 70 million oysters on seven acres, and most of it on the bottom. It's kind of hard to track anything in particular, but you notice generality. And I think that's something that people just need to pay attention to and go with what's working. I think the biggest thing that's affected yield in the last few years has been hurricanes. <laughs> And, um, you know, last season, obviously the triploid mortality down east was, was pretty bad. Um, you know, th those items obviously, you know, derail your data over time as well. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it definitely pays to track stuff. Um, but once you figure out that you have a preference for, you know, Debbie, Henry, whatever, you know, I wouldn't experiment dramatically. I, I, you know, over time, I wouldn't grow more than two lines 
um, you know, two lines are comfortable with. Um, you know, like I said, personally, it, you know, I like the way um, the two, you know, Lola's and, and Debbie's grow. Um, I'm experimenting with some lilies right now, but uh, yeah, it, it uh, you know, I, I think we have bigger fish to fry in this day, unfortunately. Um, you know, the key is diversify spawns. Don't get all of your oyster seed from one spawn. Um, so plant multiple times a year and, you know, diversify your seed source as well. And then you're, that's your best shot at, um, you know, having some sort of stable outcome. And I would just add that one thing, you know, with that really, if you're getting it at a smaller size and trying to baby it, if you can, if you have the time a little bit to just put it at a, you know, thinner density, let it have a little bit more room or something, if you can, will help a lot. Because if you're seeing, you know, really low percent yields and you're not seeing dead oysters, then that those losses are likely occurring when they're very small, because that's when you won't see the shells left over from them and things like that. Where if you're having losses later on, it's not occurring when they're, you know, if you're having losses that you're not seeing, it's not occurring with larger oysters because you'll see the shells, so. Yeah, and it never really hurts to, instead of having a backup line of triploids, to have a line of diploids going also in case, you know, this, whatever it was that hit down these past couple of years makes a return, then you don't lose your whole crop. You still got something going. You just need to prepare for your diploid taking a little bit longer to hit market. Which cheap plug, by the way, we got seed for sale. A bunch of it. Anybody's interested? <laughs> <laughs> Please come pick them oysters up. I don't want to touch them no more. I know they're mostly well. How big are they, Clamorhead? Uh, I've got everything from hanging in a nine mil grate all the way up to two inches. Damn. And they're leaving here one way or another. They're leaving here. Uh, we're getting ready to transfer a load of oysters under the SLRP, uh, the new river. And then after that, we just got a bunch of seeds. We got to work out and get ready to go. It's, been a long season. I've been tore up with a backache real bad, so slowed things down a little bit. But uh, contact me later. I think everybody knows how to get up with me, and we'll discuss prices. Because we're running some really good deals right now, just because I don't want to touch them no more. You know, they were fun the first year. I was a lot of oysters ago. Now it's it's a job. But since we've got talking time, has everybody seen our octopus? Very cool, Flammerhead. Very cool. It, uh, I didn't see the octopus. Oh, uh, gosh. It's a reef sculpture. Where do I see it? You have to be on social media, Catherine. Well, <laughs> you know me, Aaron. <laughs> Nobody would accuse me of being the queen of that. Lammerhead, I think we lost you there. You're frozen up, maybe. <laughs> um, hopefully, we'll get you back here. Yeah, they did a really cool sort of sculpture, I guess, with the, um, the Sandbar Oyster Company material into the shape of an octopus out in the in the water. It looks it looks neat. I'll see if I can find it and send it to you. Yeah, maybe send me a screenshot of it or something like that. It'd be good. Is it near the mermaid? I don't know about that. There's a mermaid. <laughs> Where's the mermaid? And an octopus? <laughs> oh no, no, it's not a mermaid. It's a woman. Uh, yeah, it's a, just a person. It's, it's called a woman Star. with a yeah. swimming cap and goggles on. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there's multiple sculptures. I like to think of it as the mermaid and the octopus. <laughs> well, this is really helpful, everybody. I appreciate it. I mean, I always come away thinking I know nothing. <laughs> and I guess that's just the way it is when you farm oysters. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe I learned a few things today that will help because I think I did. 
hope everybody else did too. Yeah, we got a lot of, I don't know if you can see uh, see us, but you got a lot of nods there, Catherine. Good. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I just want to uh, thank everybody for uh, promoting this and helping with the advertising, you know, Chris and, um, and Aaron. Um, and, uh, you know, thank you, Catherine, for coming up with this great idea. And um, we're going to push forward and uh, take this to the next seminar uh, two months from now, where we'll be talking about and speaking about uh, biofouling and uh, how to manage and uh, best control biofouling in, in the various regions throughout our, our coast. Um, so that'll be, I think, the topic for the next seminar. And, uh, you know, we have our survey results. Uh, you know, I want to give a big shout out to Allison Matzel and Chris Bailey for, for helping with that. Um, and so we have a lot, of, a lot of good seminars to line up here over the next year and uh, really look forward to, to, to learning with, with everybody. Cool, and thanks to you, Eric, and, and to you, Brian, and Aaron, and Leslie, and everybody for helping organize and make this happen. Oh, it's, it's our pleasure. Glad, glad it's come to fruition. It, it took a little while, but, um, but we got there, and it's launched, and uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's keep moving it forward. Cool. All right, have a great evening, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. All right.